And today we'll be studying uh, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, and that is Joseph. And I believe even kids, uh, they know uh, Joseph, the dreamer, right? So nonetheless, um, my prayer as we uh, journey in this new series of our theme this quarter is that uh, I will be challenging you to read Genesis chapter 37 to 50 so that we can really appreciate the lessons that we may get uh, from learning this, this story about Joseph. So the title of our new series today is Detour, Finding Purpose When Life Doesn't Make Sense. So again, in this series, we'll try to discover how God redirected Joseph's life how God has challenged his decisions into the test. And somehow we could say how God slowed down his desires. And God putting his beliefs through suffering, hardship, adversity, and I could say break his dream. In addition, and particularly we will, we will explore the origin of Joseph's life, his work ethic, which we can employ in our own jobs today. And I could say, let's also understand his heart's condition. And at the end of this series, we will dig out his wonderful legacy to future generations. So let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of worship that we can study your words. Lord, I pray that you will open our hearts and our minds, Lord, as we dig into your words. Allow us, Lord, to see the truths of your words so that we can use this truth, Lord, in our lives as your people, so that we may continually glorify and honor your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, let's start by discovering Joseph and his family. But allow me to first define what is detour. One author has said that detours are diversions from our focus path, bypasses around our goals, indirect routes to our destinations, and deviations from our plan for our lives. In short, it is taking a long road, route, a long road, or a roundabout route before reaching our desti destination. Listen. Even as Christians, we tend to have a mindset that it's better to have a short, you know, short distance, a short way, a shortcut method, or taking the shortest distance in order for us to reach our goal or our destination. We say it's much better, right? In other words, the fastest route is always the better. However, the Bible is clear that the processes and ways of God is far different from what we normally want. In other words, in a nutshell, detours are God's roadmap. Now, you and I can agree that the Christian life is not full of straight lines, right? You want to have a line that is, you know, from... Starting from A and just a straight line going to letter B, right? Sometimes our thinking is like that. But let me tell you, the Christian life is not filled with straight lines, but it is filled with curves and zigzag roads. You may not agree with me, but if you'll read the Bible over and over again, you will see the truth that I am saying this morning. All of us have a dream and a goal that we are trying to reach. The question I want to ask this morning is that, which roadmap are you following to arrive at your destination? Is it your roadmap or is it God's? Let me ask that again. Is it your roadmap or is it God's? Beloved friends and visitors this morning, I would like to believe that you are, you and I, are pursuing the path of God or the map of God because I believe with all my heart that's the only right thing to do. Never ever second guess this. So in today's message, there are three 
truths that I want to give, I would like to point out this morning, our text again will be the whole chapter of 37 and some verses in chapter 50 and maybe for reference sake, you will go back a few uh, chapters as well. Now let me give you a short summary of the story of Joseph. So, so Genesis chapter 37 is the story of a messed up family. Joseph has things to happen to him that causes his brothers to become jealous. Now we all know the story. Their father, Joseph's father, is Jacob. Now, Jacob favors Joseph most. Compared to all his brothers, we could say he's the, you know, the favored one. You could say the favorite one. Now, there was a time that Joseph initiated the jealousy in which he reported to his father, Jacob, that his brothers, they're not working well in the field. So what happened? Joseph's brothers were jealous also. Oh, they became jealous. And I could say the center of the jealousy of Joseph's brother is when Jacob, the father, gave an ornamental robe, a colored coat, which led the brothers to believe that Joseph is really the favorite one, the favorite one. Now in this story, we can also see that Joseph had a series, series of dream. Now, is that Joseph and his brothers were sheaves, and Joseph began to stand while his brother's sheep bowed down. Now the second dream is this. The sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to Joseph because, because they understood the dream. Now this is the culture that we are seeing here. In, in this culture, if you are dreaming the same dream, it tells us that it will come and that's why we can see and understand that his heart towards him. Thus, he planned to kill him. But praise God, because Reuben intervened and suggested to throw him in the pit instead because he is thinking of rescuing him later. Even Judah, if you read the story, Judah, being a business-minded man, he proposed to sell Joseph to the traveling night merchants. And then after that, they got back home and reported to their father, Jacob, that Joseph was dead. And what happened? Their father mourned, and he refused to be comforted. Meanwhile, Joseph was sold to Egypt to Potiphar. Now, let me draw some truths from this story. First, Joseph's family has the same modern problems. Joseph's family has the same modern problems. I believe the family of Joseph is an example for all of us, an ancient, a very old family as our example. But listen to this. Their problems are no strangers from ours. His family, we could say, was a complex web of relationships. In short, his family is complicated. Let me briefly explain the family tree of Joseph. Now looking at the chart, let me put my, okay, looking at the chart, so Joseph, this is the family tree of Joseph. Okay? So we have there the wives of Jacob, Leah, Okay, the eldest sister of Rachel, which is the youngest sister. And Jacob has two concubines, Zilpah and Bilhah. You will see there, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, God, Asher. And they have one daughter, which is Dinah, Dan, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. If you are, if you are jo Jacob and you have four wives, what can you picture? What can you imagine? 
sitting on one table. <laughs> Good evening, I said, it's a headache. It's true. You know, four wi two wives, two concubines, 12 sons, and one daughter. I mean, it's complicated, we could say. But this is the family of Joseph. This is the family that we are seeing here. And we could say that Joseph's general, generational heritage and immediate family were highly dysfunctional. Now, I would like to explain some of the things here. Here are the things that describe Joseph's family. Number one, Jacob's life was primarily characterized by deception. Let me go back a few chapters. Genesis chapter 27 to chapter 33. Okay, Jacob's life was primarily characterized by deception. We know, we all know the story of Jacob. I mean, the name itself, the meaning of the name of Jacob is the deceiver, right? So we know that uh, he deceived his brother Esau. His brother was the firstborn, Esau, but he took his birthright by bribing. Not only that, but he took away also his blessing from his father Isaac. Remember, in the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew culture, it is always the eldest son who will receive the blessing. But Jacob took it away from him. Now, although we know from the story, it's not really him, it's not really Jacob who initiated it, but it was his mother, Rebekah. If you will read the whole story of Jacob, it's clear that the mother of Jacob advises him to deceive his father. So, from this story, we can see that both Rebekah and Jacob plotted to deceive Isaac. And number two, the brothers of Jacob were obsessed with revenge. This is the second thing that we are seeing in this family. The brothers of J Joseph were obsessed with revenge. Genesis chapter 34, verse 2, recorded, it says there, that, and when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her. He took her and lay with her and violated her. So there's only one daughter in the family, right? It's Dinah. Now, Dinah was violated. He was, she was raped. Now this is where revenge comes into the picture. When the man who raped Jacob's daughter asked for a marriage, Dinah's brother, namely Simeon and Lev Levi, saw it as an opportunity to take revenge for their sister. They resolved to have their sister marry Shechem, provided that all the men in the city will get circumcised. And if you will read the story in Genesis chapter 34, that it happened that on the third day, when all the men in the city were in pain, Simeon and Levi killed all the men, including Shechem and Hamor. Can you imagine that? You see, it's not only revenge that we can notice here, but deception is evident as well. Now third, Jacob, the father of Joseph, Isaac, the grandfather of Joseph, faced conflict with avoidance and passivity. Genesis 26, 6 to 11, chapter 35, verse 22. Now this is the part, you know, we all know the story here. In Genesis 26, this is the part when Isaac, the father of Jacob, lied about his wife, Sarah. He told the king of Gerar, which is king Abimelech, that Sarah was his wife, was his wife. Though we know, all know that it's, it's half lie because truly she is also a sister. For Jacob's part in chapter 35 of Genesis, his eldest son Reuben lay with Bilhah. Who is Bilhah? One of the concubines of Jacob, right? Father's concubine. But what happened? He, he did not confront his eldest son. You see, both displayed avoidance and passiveness. You know, they just ignored the situation. And when things like this happen, I mean, we could say when the man 
of the house turned to be passive. I don't know if this is happening in your family. Sometimes it's happening in my family. When the man of the house turned, what? Passive. Who, t who takes over? Wife. The wife, right. You're correct. The woman of the house will take over. Well, this is true. In the story of Jacob, Rebekah took over the life of his son. Now, number four. Jacob deliberately conveyed his favoritism to Joseph. If there is one character of this family that is so evident, and this is, this is the character that I'm taking, I'm saying right now. Jacob deliberately conveyed his favoritism to Joseph. It's understandable to note that Joseph was the favorite of Jacob because it says in our text that he was the son of his old age. Right? Not only that, but Jacob displayed his favoritism by giving Joseph a tunic of many colors, or in other versions, a richly ornamented robe. Now, look at this church. Listen, I know I'm giving a lot of history or or story here behind our message this morning. Would like us to see this. This is very important. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, has two sons, right? Namely Esau who is the eldest, and then Jacob, the youngest, the favorite one. Then, when Jacob became a father, he had 12 sons. And among the 12, his favorite was Joseph. Think, come to think of it, is it coincidence that Joseph will be the favorite? Well, we all have the saying, if you are the youngest, you will be the favorite one. Somehow, I do believe that because the, I'm the youngest of the family. <laughs> so, all the packages from the States, from Australia, I'm the one receiving it. <laughs> okay, maybe somehow that's the reality here. But somehow, this is, this is a truth that we want us to look at this morning. Please take note. It was not Joseph's fault that he was the favorite of his father. It was not. At the age of 17, if you'll read the story of Joseph, at the age of 17, his mind, we could say, is innocent, and we cannot see from the story that he did, you know, he did anything, or he do anything to gain the favor of his father. In short, it was Jacob's parenting mistake, you could say. Well, you may not agree with that, but that's what we are seeing in this story. One pastor has said, and I quote, listen to this quote, favoritism leads to family dysfunction. It is the seed of family destruction. You may not see the truth here in your own family, but let this be a reminder to all of us. Favoritism is not God's will for your family. Number five, the brothers of Joseph were full of hatred and jealousy. Genesis 37, 5 to 11. So this started when Joseph was favored much by his father. It's very obvious to say. Then, then hatred and jealousy have grown stronger. Listen, when he shared his dreams with his brothers. Again, let me re reiterate what I'm saying a while ago. In the, in the culture of Hebrew people, if someone would dream... The same dream, it is believed to come true. And we all know from the story, the dream of Joseph came true. Right? Now, if you are one of the brothers of Joseph, how would you feel? What will be your reactions when Joseph was giving his dreams that his brothers will bow down to him, the 11 stars will bow down to him? And we all know the story that his brothers and even his father Jacob reacted you mean we will bow down to you? I mean, can you imagine the response of his brothers? I think what I can see here is that you would envy. You would envy Joseph. Six, the brothers of Joseph demonstrated their hatred by betrayal. 37 of Genesis 18 to 28. Now in these verses... His brothers plotted and conspired to kill him. But again, thank God because God is working in the life of Joseph because 
God used Reuben to intervene to save him. Now here's a personal question. I want us to ponder seriously as people of God. How far has your jealousy or envy takes you? Whether you admit it or not, you have been jealous. You have expressed envy in your life. Amen? But the question is this. How far has your jealousy or envy takes you? And let me give you an example. In our family, in my family, in your family, we have disputes, we have disagreements, we have fighting. Amen? Oh, you're, you're a good family member. <laughs> but let me say this again. You may not agree with me, but I believe in every family, we have disputes, we have disagreements, and we have fighting. Amen? Amen. You see, here's the message that we are getting here. I want us to understand. Hatred and jealousy is envy. Envy makes us heartless because envy steals our hearts. If we are envious, we would not care even if even if it, des it, it destroys our family. Right? That is envy. Jealousy, we could say, is still a minor thing, but when you have envy, is a danger for all of us. Church, what is God saying to you right, right now about this truth? Now, now, this leads me to the second point of this message which is the painful reality. At this point, I want to express an extremely, I could say, important note for all of us, especially as parents. I'm explaining these things because I want us to, I want us to see our family. Look at your family right now. Look at the problems that your family are having right now. The challenges that they are facing, that you are facing. And what are the actions that we should take to improve the situation within the family? Another note, remember, we are not to compare our family with other families. Though sometimes it's true, and in reality, we tend to compare our family with other families. But please bear in mind, this is a reminder for all of us, we should not compare our family with other families. Because the painful reality is this. The reason why we should not compare our family with other families is because they are perfect families. This is the painful reality. There are. If you are saying my family is perfect, well, you can say that. I cannot stop you from saying that. But for me, I believe there are no perfect families. The Bible is telling us, even the Bible characters in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, we can see that they are not perfect. However, does it mean because we don't have a perfect family that we should not do anything about it? No. Church, this should not make us unaware and passive as to what we must deal in our families. Particularly if what we are seeing in our family is not good and it is not right in the sight of God. We might say, Pastor, I'm always thinking, you know, what is good and what is beneficial for my family. Well, it's good. Praise God. Nevertheless, my question is this. How sure are you? How sure are you? How sure am I? Because sometimes you may seem that what we are doing in our family is good and it is right. But sometimes if we will go back to his words, to the Bible, to what God is saying to all of us, we are saying that our family is not following God. What really matters, church, listen, friends, beloved, what really matters is not your opinion about your family. But what's the point of God that, is, that really matters? Things that are helpful 
The things that are so for our family are the things that please God. Amen? I hope that you will be challenged as fathers and mothers, as leaders of our own family, that we will always put God always in our lives. The standard of God, it is not yours. It is not mine. You know, sometimes it's so sad that we tend to use the standard of the culture we have. The people. The things that people are doing in this culture, in this nation. The church, let me say this, not even your ch children's preference, even if they, you know, if they, even if they are old enough to make decisions for themselves, don't allow them. If you know that they're not following the will of God in their lives, don't allow them. Because if you will allow them, what are you saying to, you, to yourself? What are you saying to God? Remember, as people of God, our standard, our basis is always the word of God. That's why my challenge is that we should always ask God for wisdom and knowledge. Church, the fact that all families are not perfect, this includes yours and mine. It should make us realize that we have a huge responsibility and accountability before God, particularly about our personal spiritual life and the spiritual lives of our children. If I will ask you this morning, and I'm not judging, okay? I'm not judging. I'm not saying this to say to you that you are a bad father or you're, ba you're a bad mother. No, I'm not saying this. What I'm saying is this. Our first priority is the spiritual life of our children. I know you are all good providers. You want to give all the things that your children want and their needs as well. But let me say this. Observe, evaluate the spiritual lives of your children. Are they walking in the Lord? Do they really love the Lord in their lives? I feel like you, you have been quiet a bit. It may be. I'm not, I'm not saying this because my kids are good compared to yours. No. I mean, it's the other way around because they are my kids, right? Church, I want to encourage you this morning. If you will have a truthful evaluation of your lives, especially to, to all of you as fathers and leaders of our family, what are you doing right now as a father to help and lead your children, your family to the Lord? Oh, pastor, I'm so tired and I, my kids doesn't really want to listen to me. Well, I get that. I understand that. Does it mean that you will stop? Does it mean that you will not do anything? Church, I know you're listening right now. Mothers, mothers, you need to do something. If your children are turning away from God, they're not living the life that God wants them, you have a big task. Why? Because every home is broken as a result of the fall and the curse. In other words, the root cause of this is sin. The root cause of all of these things, this dysfunction of the family is sin. This is the core problem and the bad news. What Joseph experienced, what you and I go through, the dysfunction that we have is embedded in sin. Let me read to you Romans chapter 3, 10 to 11. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have, broke, they be, they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Even Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is the meaning of these verses? What, what 
words Paul, the Apostle Paul is conveying. Listen, the Apostle Paul is looking at the human condition from top to bottom. Dr. Warren Wiersbe he says this, and I quote, he calls this passage as an x-ray study of the lost sinner from head to foot. I mean, listen, this condition of man, I could say, is so depressing. It's sad, it is disheartening. But this is the truth. This is the reality that we have in our sinful nature. We sin against God. We, we break God's law. We don't want to seek God. We don't want to follow God. That's the condition of man. It's very clear in that passage in Romans. We fail to do what is righteous in God's sight because we are sinners. We have the sinful nature. However, maybe some of you, or many of you would say, but don't all the religious conviction, Pastor, maybe the rituals and the habits from the beginning of time reveal that man seeks God. I mean, look at the, all the religions that we have. They all have rituals. They want to do things you know, in their own way. Is that a message that man is seeking God? What's our answer? I believe not at all. I don't believe that's man's way of seeking God. Because if man will make the first move to search God, he doesn't seek the true God himself. Let me give you an example. I think the best example is the people of God. Remember, after they were, uh, what, redeemed from slavery, it was commanded by God that after uh, being redeemed from slavery in Egypt, they will go to this mountain that is on Mount Sinai, remember? And then on Mount Sinai, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. He went up to the top of the mountain. And the people began to complain. And they said, where is Moses? And then what happened to the story? Listen to this. This is, this is a truth that I want us to give. I want to give to you this morning. The people came to Aaron. And they said to Aaron, Aaron, make us a God. Make us a God. What's happening here? They have a God, right? They, they have Yahweh. They have, you know, the God of the Bible. But why are they asking Aaron, the brother of Moses, that he needs to make them a God? You see the truth? They have seen the power. They have seen that God has done for them in Egypt. Right? Can you imagine if you were one of the Israelite people back then when God separated the Red Sea? Can you imagine them walking on dry ground? Can you imagine that? But why would the people of Israel would ask for another God? You see, this is the truth. A lot of people even we as Christians, we tend to forget that we, have, we already have the true God in our lives. We don't want to believe Him. We don't want to follow Him. Listen, let me add, let me add to this. Don't you know that in this generation of preachers and teachers of the Word, they do not even speak the word sin in their congregation? I know you can see them and hear them in, in YouTube, right? on YouTube. I don't want to mention their names, but you know this one. They said that you don't need to say that word. What you can do is that give positive words, encouragement, positive things. Why? Because these preachers, the teachers of the law, so-called teachers and preachers of the word, they said that oh, the people have experienced a lot of difficulty, you know, hard times in their lives as people. 
Why would you give them about their sin, you know, rebuking them and disciplining them? Why? You see, church, the world that we are in right now is changing. But the thing is this. If I will give you a message that is only positive, I know right now it's so difficult sometimes. But if you will hear me just say, oh, God loves you, you don't need to ask forgiveness for your sins. What will we feel? What will I feel? Church, just to, just to connect the truth with our own family. Say that we need to be firm and grounded in the Word of God. Let me say that again. In connection to our family, I want to say that we need to be firm and grounded in the Word of God. I admit that I am not patient sometimes. I am not, you know, I'm angry. I'm annoyed sometimes with my kids. I love them. But I love more of my wife, of course. But let me say this. When I see something in my children that is not proper and pleasing in the sight of God, I must do something. I must do something. And this is also my prayer to all of you as parents. We are not perfect, that's true. And the fact that we are not perfect, the more that we must see ourselves. That we have a huge and big responsibility as parents. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, all of us must agree on this. Because it must be true in our own families, as true disciples of Jesus, the one we are pleasing, the one we are honoring, the one we are satisfying is not our family is not you, is not other people. It is God alone. It is God alone. Let me read to you Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I know this is hard to accept. But friends, to allow our kids to do what they want and not training our families in the way of the Lord is a disgrace to God. Is a disgrace to God. Satan. Satan and his demons are targeting our families 24-7. Right? What should you do? What should I do? I believe we should double time as well. In protecting our children from the works of the enemy. Now this leads me to the final point of our message this morning. This cycle of dysfunction is not unavoidable. It can happen anytime. It can happen anywhere. That is why as people of God, this is where we must focus our hearts and our minds. The solution to the dysfunction in our family can only be broken by the choices we make in response to God's grace. The final truth is this. Breaking the cycle of sin in your family. And I will use chapter 50. Genesis 50, 15 to 21. I will not be reading it. Listen church. By trusting God, Joseph refused to be defined by the dysfunction of his family. Let me say this truths here. Joseph rejected deception and he chose integrity. Second, he rejected revenge and he chose forgiveness. Third, he rejected, rejected passivity and chose initiative. Fourth, he rejected favoritism and he chose impartiality. He rejected jealousy and he chose contentment. And finally, he rejected betrayal and chose loyalty. Church, what's the message here? The solution to the dysfunction of our families is the good news. In other words, it is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. 
Oh, pastor, what should I do? What's the solution to my problem, to my kids, to my wife, to my husband, and everything that is going around in my family? What's the solution, pastor? Well, church, the only solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even, even Romans 10, 9 to 10 states that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes leading to righteousness and with the mouth he confesses leading to salvation. In other words, real change and transformation can happen now. Listen, can happen now to you and to your family because of the Lord Jesus Christ. By His grace, we can do this if we allow Jesus to help us make the right choices. And let this be a question to all of us this morning. Search your heart right now. Have you really placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you are seeing your life, your family, that as if it doesn't have any solution, it's just getting worse and worse, maybe you need to ask, is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Savior? As parents, we all want our children to truly follow the Lord. Amen? How many of you, you, that's your prayer, that's your desire as parents? Right? I hope, I mean, that's, that's the will of God. That all of our children, though in reality no, we know that I mean, it's not happening to all the people of God. But that's our prayer. The point that I'm saying as I end the message of God this morning, the first step is for you, for me, to surrender everything to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me go back to my, to my question. Have you really accepted and believed and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? What does it mean? It means that when you die, you are sure that you will be in heaven someday. It's not 99%, it's 100%. You don't have any doubt, not a single doubt, that you know because you have placed and you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in your life as Lord and Savior, you don't have any doubt that one day when you die, you know that you will be in heaven someday. Is that true in your life? I cannot see your heart, I cannot read your mind. Only God can see it. But this is my prayer. If you have really accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, it will be evident in your life because the Holy Spirit will work in your life. Friends, beloved, let's not be deceived that when you say you love God, listen, let us not be deceived that when you say you love God, but you are not desiring to follow His commands and His will in your life, and you don't have the desire to turn away from sins, I believe you have not genuinely put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you have truly, genuinely placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will, right? You will follow His will. You will obey His commands. Not those things that you want, but all. That's the proof that your, your faith is genuine, that your faith is real. Remember, God sees every intent of our hearts. We cannot fool Him. We cannot. So to answer the simple the, the questions, that I've asked, Jesus is all we need to overcome everything in this life, specifically the battles that we have in the family. Let me add. 
I don't want to pass this moment not to say this. Let me be blunt and take, I hope that you won't, you won't take it personally, okay? Peace. We are at peace with one another. I want to say this because I need to. If there are things in your family that is happening right now, if you have disagreements with your family, if you have disputes and fighting within your family right now, I want to say this. Your enemy is not your wife. Your enemy is not your husband. Your enemy are not your children. Your enemy are not even other people. Who is your enemy? Your enemy is Satan. It's not your wife, it's not your husband, it's not your kids, it's not, other, it's not even other people. But the thing is that within the family we are fighting with one another. We quarrel, we complain with one another. You want to have that kind of atmosphere in your family? That every day you are fighting with one another? I hope you don't want that. I'm not saying that my family is, is perfect, no. It's really far from being perfect. I want to say this truth. Church, give ourselves to God so that God will bless our life Genuinely surrender your attitude of being a selfish person so that love for our family will be evident. Again, let me go back to the things I've said a while ago. Beloved, what are the things that you need to reject in your life and in your family? Is it deception? Is it revenge? Is it avoidance or passivity? Is it favoritism? Is it hatred? Is it je jealousy? Is it betrayal? Or should I say, all of the above? What's your response to the message of God this morning? Between you and God, between your family and God, what will you do? What can God do to your family right now? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we recognize, Lord, that your words are true. And we acknowledge, Lord, that our understanding, our knowledge on how to lead our family, Lord, is so limited. We fail most of the times. But Lord, does it mean that because our families are not perfect, does it mean that we should stop? Maybe some of us this morning are saying, I'm so tired of teaching my kids. I'm so tired of leading my family. I'm so depressed. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, I believe God is really speaking to your hearts right now. I know. We all know. We all journey in this life. It is a challenge, Lord. That's the truth. Even I... I could say in my life, that I don't, I don't know what to do, what words, what kind of discipline that I need to do so that you know, my kids will follow us, my kids will follow you. And sometimes, Lord, it's so... It's so frustrating. But Lord, in light of your words this morning, in 
connection to our family, Lord. To all that is, that is happening right now. To all the dysfunction, the characters that our family had. There is a solution to all of these things. And that is the Lord. Jesus Christ. Please, please, oh God, help all of us as your people. We don't want to hide anymore. We don't want to hide the things in our family, Lord. We want to be free from all the curse of sin. Free us, O oh Lord. If there are things in our family, Lord, that is not right in your sight, because our ultimate goal, Lord, our ultimate aim and dream, it is always to give honor to please you, to, to, to satisfy our God, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Once again, thank you. Let this moment be a moment that we can just surrender everything to you. Personally, Lord, as a father, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, Lord, we come to you. We come in the name of Jesus. Speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. Brothers and sisters and the Lord, friends, beloved, do not harden your hearts. Do not. Please do not harden your hearts. Listen to God's word. Listen to Him. Follow Him. Follow Him.